So welcome to the next talk uh, with the title Top 10 Usability Obstacles. I was told there would be roughly around 10. <laughs> we'll see. Um, we're going to be surprised. Our speaker today is uh, Bob Marvin. He's a user experience designer from Czech Republic. And he's talking about the problem that a lot of the times um, the people who are developing applications don't think enough about the users who are ultimately going to use these applications. So he's going to tell you a little bit about the very common design mistakes and how you can avoid them. So please give Bob a huge round of applause and welcome him. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Mm, first, I have to say that this is first time when I'm here in this Congress, and I'm pretty much excited from this place, and I'm much more excited that I can talk here. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> so, uh, let me introduce a little bit more. Um, my nickname is Bob Marvan, and as was mentioned, I'm UX designer at AVG.com, the online security company, uh, last two years. Uh, and before I used to work in Sysnam CZ, I don't know how familiar you are with this company, but it's something like Czech Yahoo, and it's still competing with Google in Czech Republic, so it's pretty much a big online company. And as was promised, I'd like today to show you and explain you uh, my top approximately 10 usability obstacles. And uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to make it through some story. And why I like to do it this way, it's simple. Everybody, everybody uh, talk a lot of uh, holistic approach to design, uh, like end-to-end -end journeys, uh, user experience, and so on. Uh, but I'd like to take you back to the roots, take you back to the basics, and show you still quite common mistakes which happen in user interfaces. And why? Because I think it can help you uh, to produce better, better software, hardware, devices, gadgets, and stuff like this. And if I said that I'd like to sh tell you a story. It will be a story about Captain Nemo and Treasure Hunt. Are you curious? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so let's the story begin. Oops. Actually, this is first quite common mistake which uh, uh, really happened to uh, almost every of you. It's some meaningless splash screen. Please forgot about something like this. And actually, can somebody help me uh, with the buttons at the, at the bottom? Which, which one I should pick? Retry. Uh, retry. No, 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 OK. Why, why, why? Why retry? Why not OK? Like, OK, so this was something like first, first try. Now we can start. <clears throat> Imagine that you are somewhere in the deep ocean where is only some iceberg. And I'd like to introduce you Captain Nemo. This is our hero. <laughs> this is, this is <clears throat> So, but, but what's, what's wrong with him? Uh, actually, uh, he's on the iceberg and he got two big questions in his mind. Where the hell I am and where I should go? And we can a little bit help him with it. So, he's on North Pole and obviously <laughs> he can go to the South. 
because <laughs> from from this place there isn't any other option. Yeah? So, and let's move to the practice. I'd like to start with nothing smaller than Apple. This is screenshot from Apple support. Okay, the the title itself it's quite fine, but. I totally missed the orientation on the left side. There is no mark here. And actually, these bullet points are my navigation. Those are links. Those words are active links, and I cannot recognize them. So I got big troubles with my orientation and navigation. This is first big mistake, which repeats often and again and again. <clears throat> okay, let's, uh, because I promise you the treasure hunt, uh, our Captain Nemo would like to find some treasure, but at first he need to find his submarine, famous Nautilus. So he dive and start looking for the submarine. But again, he don't knows what to do here. Why? Because again, there is missing navigation and also some interaction elements. How can Captain Nemo know that this ancient bridge, or what is it, can move without any significant mark on it? And <clears throat> if I'm talking about navigation, I mean really the navigation, not uh, the menu. What's the difference between menu and navigation? The menu is the list of anything, where is too many items, but the navigation, navigation is the device in your car which you lets you to your goal. And it, try to imagine how big is the difference when you are in some restaurant and try to find something in big menu and how you feel in your car when the navigation lets you directly to the target. So the navigation is that helpful thing, not the menu. So we need to navigate people to their goals. But back to, back to the interaction elements. Now Captain Nemo knows that he can move the, the bridge. And I got another example from Apple. <coughs> uh, I'm, I'm sorry, this is in Czech, because I don't like to switch my whole iPhone into English. But you can probably recognize that this is alarm clock. And I know one girl uh, whose alarm clock looks exactly like this. And there is one simple reason why it looks like this, because she simply don't know that she has to swipe over, over the alarm to delete it. Yeah, it's pretty much easy, but without any visual clue, you simply don't know that you have to swipe over it. But we know it, so we can, we can swipe. And yeah, that's the that's second, second mistake, yeah, sorry. The stop hiding features. Please stop hiding features and content. It's pretty, pretty big mistake. But now we can swipe and move forward. Ah, maybe, maybe you recognize that now you can see this element here on the, on the left side. So we can click on it. Ta-da! Some icons. Could anybody uh, from you tell me what does this icons mean? Probably. Fresh, fresh, fresh. OK, OK. Sorry? <laughs> OK, so jellyfish, fish, another fish, an anchor. Yeah, so what I'd like to explain here is that the icon needs labels. I know that then it's not so sexy, but please add to all your icons some, I have to say, meaningful labels, because if you add labels like this, nothing will help. So please change it to something like this. And again, some practical example. 
please recognize usability.gov. Uh, actually, on the left side, there are three icons. I can guess that these are some documents, uh, but I'm not sure. But it's definitely sure that you have to hover over it to see what's inside. That's, from my perspective, this is a terrible mistake, like hiding information, hiding labels. Please add meaningful labels everywhere. That, that really helps people. <clears throat> and actually, you can, ah, sorry. <laughs> this was about microcopy, as I said, add labels everywhere. And actually, you can also try to warn people before danger. But please be sure that they never listen to the warnings and they will fall down and be trapped uh, somewhere in the deep, deep hole. <laughs> and the, the point of this, this situation is that every time when users are in some deep hole, troubles, uh, deep, deep whatever, <laughs> you should provide them some under function to recover from it, to make one step backwards, to try the action again. And probably the best example of this is the famous <laughs> undo, <laughs> undo function inside of <laughs> Gmail. Uh, you can only imagine what happens if you send wrong email to wrong people. <laughs> so, and if you, if you if you use Gmail and uh, got this function turned off, I suggest you to turn it on. But other way, uh, the first point is under function. It's also pretty much important. Or not, not only undo, but uh, any possible option to recovery from everything. Yeah. So our Captain Nemo now can recover from this deep hole. And finally, he found uh, his famous submarine Nautilus. And he's staring on something. What's this? Two, two circles. Again, you can only guess at this moment. I can a little bit help you. Some, some ideas? Windows, Windows, maybe Windows, or? Buttons. buttons, fine. Those are two buttons. <laughs> and now I think it's pretty much clear that those are the buttons, and because uh, Nautilus is under the sea, and Captain Nemo would like to uh, simply go up to uh, sea level, he has to push the left button. But what about? this help to him. Is it better? I hope so. Like, your UI should really help people, again, navigate them or, like, help them to understand what's going on. If I go one step back, those buttons are fine. You can recognize that, those, the, that, that these are buttons. One is for up and down. But the shape and layout is the thing what makes the difference here. Flat example. On the screen are three buttons, but actually only this one looks like button. Those are some boxes. Yeah. It's really difficult to recognize them. If I, if I made this improvement, it's almost the same. It's a little bit skeuomorphism, but it's definitely better to perception. Visual perception of those buttons is much better than of the flat. 
at this moment, I have to say I'm not against the flat design, but I think the uh, it's it's simple too much. The material design, as was introduced by Google, is slightly better because all the shadows and uh, layers uh, get some meanings, and you can much better recognize uh, what is able to click on or touch, move, and everything. So this five, fifth, sorry, fifth point is guiding UI. Let keep in mind that your user interface should guide people forward, not confuse them. And if we, are uh, if we get guiding UI, like this big button, and the big word is important because uh, you may be heard about mobile first design, but my personal approach is touch first. Everything is touchable now. And if you produce such tiny, maybe nice, but tiny UI elements, which are too close together and too small to touch, then it sucks. So please use big buttons. And once user click on it, provide them some reaction. Light them up, play some sound, or something like that. So all buttons, or not only buttons, elements of UI should represent the state that they were pressed. And not only pressed, but we can also inform people that something is happening, yeah, like some progress bar. And maybe also that five meters left, left to the surface. OK, <clears throat> we are almost there. <clears throat> this, this part was about the reactions. But let's move back to Captain Nemo. Yes. Yes, he's still going up, and you probably think that this is Link, and you are wrong. This title was designed by some crazy designer, and he simply used the blue color and underline to highlight the headline. And again, it's wrong. When you start designing misleading UI, that something what's not active looks active and opposite way. It's the best way how to confuse people. So please don't do it this way. But that's not the main point of this slide. The main point is here. Treasure this way. It looks almost like an Edward, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, sometimes I saw uh, examples when people try to attract their users so much that they like overthink the whole uh, elements or whole design and produce important buttons like this. And then it looks like this. Actually, this whole box is the most important button on the page. But because it looks like banner, it's probably overviewed. Those are links. Yeah? It's, it's quite clear. They are, in this case, red. They, they get underlined. But this looks like an advert. So let's skip it. So please keep in your mind uh, that there is something what we call banner blindness. And don't produce elements of UI as banners. Keep them. On this distance. And now we are back on the sea level, and uh, it's not so visible, but there is some fog here. <laughs> and inside of that fog, something is coming to us, and it's simple statement that contrast and size matters. If you don't design uh, or don't use the, the letters big enough and with 
sufficient contrast, then it will look like this. Actually, on this screen is not so bad, but uh, because we, we got here quite high uh, contrast ratio, but all these tags on ordinary screen are pretty much small, and they are on gray background. And trust me, it's all, all, also for me, I am not so blind as it looks like. Uh, it's difficult to, oh, sorry. It's difficult for me to read those texts. So please avoid to use gray on gray or small letters. Uh, we are still older and older, and our eyes are still weaker and weaker. And once we will be old, we like to read all interfaces. So please keep in mind that there are already some old people which like to use uh, your interfaces, and this can really help them. This point was about contrast and size. We can call it also accessibility. This is not only one rule for accessibility, but this is the important one, because this is about the information uh, perception. And on the right side there, it looks like some mountain. Our Captain Nemo is here on the top. And see this incredible scene. Some fish in, in the air, some bird under the sea. Mm, terrible. I'd like to organize it. It's another important thing. It's grouping. The related things should be together, like same birds, the same birds, fish together. When there is some border, it's visible, but between, between, for example, birds, there is no border. And also, the visual hierarchy, it's important. Uh, this is a nice example. On the left side, there is some, some app. And here is some button. Yeah, like uh, the screenshots is so small because the distance is so big. And this is a nice example how don't uh, connect things together. Because if really this button is related to this app, then why it's so far? Back to the hierarchy. I'd like. Uh, to keep in your minds, <laughs> or like put in your minds that visual the visual hierarchy is another important thing which you have to follow in your web designs or apps. Why? Because, for example, this small rearrangement means more than 30% difference. This version is better because the logical order of text and call to action button is simple in one flow. So people are able to read the headline first, then observe the picture, read the rest, and finally take an action. This is not logical order. This is the logical one. And yes, obviously, you can always test it, uh, but when you design something, please follow the hierarchy, linearity, and then the overall performance will be definitely better. So this was about hierarchy and some clustering. <coughs> and we are moving forward. Captain Nemo dive again. and. He receives some alert. You reach five meters. Hmm. OK. He continues. Any other, any other alert? 10 meters. Fine. 20 meters. <laughs> OK. Oh. <laughs> this is. What's happening when you overuse alerts and notification? Uh, 
probably everybody of us got a lot of apps in our smartphones and all of these apps try to somehow notify us, uh, push something on us, uh, spam us with emails and if you, if you produce something similar, uh, you will end up with something like this. <laughs> <clears throat> Nobody cares about it. So the this point is about notification overload. And it, it's it's pretty much important because uh like people became real blind to notifications and uh the ultimate result of some overload of notification or <clears throat> uh, simple overuse notification could be uninstall. So if you'd like not to make people angry, please don't overuse the notification. And finally, we are almost at the end and we reach the treasure here. It's quite obvious that it could be open <laughs> or it should be open. <laughs> Uh, because it's button on it. Should I open it? <laughs> okay, so congratulations. <laughs> you just found the treasure and actually you can download the full scale uh, presentation on this link. Uh, and why? Because uh, without the big picture, you cannot build the user story well. And the user story contains all the small pieces. So from the small pieces, from the details, we build the whole user journey. So as I mentioned at the beginning, that I don't like to speak about some holistic approach or some end-to-end -end journey. I was kidding. <laughs> As you can see, we made it together uh, and we are at the end. So thank you. Thank you very much for showing us where the treasure is. <laughs> we now have around half an hour for Q&A, so if you have questions, please move to the microphones that are dispersed through the room. <clears throat> if you are already leaving the talk, please be silent and do it quietly so you don't disturb the other people who want to ask questions. We are going to start with a question from the internet. So one user asks that you said that a button could make a sound, but isn't that a um, rather annoying for the user and for other people around him? Okay, um, if sounds are annoying. I, actually, at this moment, I was sort of talking about uh, user interfaces in general. So, in cases of some sounds uh, which are produced by, for example, an apps, it could be annoying, but on the other hand, Imagine that, for example, not imagine, like um, another example is simply the Mercedes, the automotive company, which one of the interests of this company is the sound of the closing door. It has to sound expensive <laughs> because you spent a lot of money on your Mercedes. That's the first thing. The second thing is that uh, the sound of the door is that thing which ensures you that the doors are closed. The technology is so far that it's possible to produce completely silent door. It's really possible to close the door of the car without any noise. But at that moment, you simply don't know that the doors are closed. So. It depends. Sometimes the sound could be annoying, but in case of other actions and interactions with your devices, it could be real helpful. 
All right, thank you. Please let me remind you again to please be quiet if you want to chat about how awesome the treasure is or if you're already leaving the room, please remain quiet. Next question from Mike number two. Okay, thank you. Um, on sixth reaction, why has the progress bar how up or down I am in a vertical, uh, not in a vertical, in a horizontal way? You, you presented that mm -hmm. he's 30% up yeah. and you said to the right and not to the yeah, top. Yeah. My mistake. <laughs> And you're right. And actually, actually, uh, we can we can look at it here. Actually, if you if you see the space which left there for me, that's the mistake. I didn't left to uh, I didn't left uh, enough space for the progress bar on the right side. <laughs> so I put it under. And yes, you're right. Com that the the better solution could be like the, the vertical progress bar. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mike, and number good four, point, Really good point. <laughs> so um, you mentioned uh, about labeling icons. Uh -huh. Now, I personally strongly disagree, and here's the point. If you compare the uh, traffic signs in Europe uh, against the traffic signs in the USA, you will find that the traffic signs in the USA are mostly text labels. And the problem with that is you have to mental, you have to actively parse them. So you have two sim kinds of symbol recognition going on at the same time. You have your visual symbol recognition, which translates shapes, letters, into something, uh, some semantics into words. And then you have a second parsing step, which parses, mm -hmm. parses these words into the actual meaning. The problem is you have two parsing steps, and this uh, part of this parsing step is a very conscious process. So. If you compare the two traffic signs in Europe, in, in USA you have no parking, no halting, two times text. You, you would say this is very clear what it intends. But if you're in an intense driving situation with very time constraints, this is a problem. On the other hand, if you drive around in Europe, you have two very distinct signs. They are of similar shape, but they are different enough that you can see them in a glimpse, mostly from a peripheral vision. And this makes it much easier and far quicker to read. Now, when it comes to icons, the problem I see is that most designers uh, go forward and try to make it artsy and not mm -hmm. very clear. So in the, uh, when the World, tra uh, World Fair in New York was st uh, started, uh, the Department of Transportation of the US, they initiated a, a project to create a universal symbolic language that would Uh, be immediately recognizable by everyone around. This is, these are stairs, these are restrooms, and these don't mm -hmm. have text. The point here is, uh, these are readable no matter which cultural background you have. If you label something, then you assume that the person is reading English or German. Now, if you have, say, uh, an ATM machine and it's configured to say English and uh, an Chinese user or a Japanese user wants mm -hmm. to use, he has to be able to read English. In the same way, if I'm going to an ATM in, uh, in say, Japanese, I don't speak Japanese and I can't read it, I, I would be lost. So if there is an mm -hmm. icon which directly gives me a hint, oh, here I can select the language, then I don't have to be able to read this. So labeling icons, <laughs> not a good idea. Make the icons meaningful and universal possible. Thank you, thank you for this point. Uh, I agree, I only like to add this. Uh, there were some researchers run on this topic and the result was that uh, this uh, like universal and meaningful icons uh, exists, there exists definitely, but in only very few amount, like there is only something like seven really universal icons, seven pieces, and we got much more actions which we need to represent. And actually, <coughs> I put it there because of quite common mistake of wrong usage of icons. If I can choose, for example, in the case of that example from usability.gov, uh, I prefer only text label in this case. Yeah, so I'm showing you common mistake, which you described. And the additional point is that, yes, we can use universal icons, but 
please, please, really carefully. There is only a few of them which are really universal for perception. All right, let's move to mic number three. Well, my question is linked to the previous one. Uh, now, if we have different languages, even for simple languages in UX design, why don't we have like different version of apps or websites for different symbolic understanding? Like technical users look out for quite other UI designs than normal user or my older mother or someone else. Mm. I, if, if I understand you properly, you ask for different kind of designs of one thing, one application, for example? Yes. Yeah. Like we have different um, language versions mm. of a website, but we usually don't have different graphical interfaces for the same website. Uh, Is this a topic? Do you know anything yeah. about that? Uh, yeah, uh, actually, in case of websites, it isn't worth it. This is applied in much, much more complex systems, not on websites. But this, what you are talking about, is applied, for example, I know it from CAD system, CAD, uh, Computer Edit Design, like AutoCAD, KCA, and so on. Those softwares are uh, really set up that way that you can choose different settings if you are a beginner, for example, or advanced user. So based on your knowledge, you uh, receive really different UI. Because it's worth it in that case. Because you spend much more time. You spend with, with uh, CAD systems, you spend hours per day. On some web page, you spend maybe 50 seconds. That's the difference. So that's the reason why on websites we don't get different designs, but in, in other software applications, we get it. All right, next question from Mike number two. Could you talk a little bit about the difference between graphic design, i.e. making things pretty and beautiful, and usability? Because I feel like often these get conflated, and they're uh, kind of different. Yeah. Uh, what to say? Like it's it's a really really big topic. How to uh, like combine the visual design or aesthetics with uh, usability, accessibility, and so on. Uh, the uh, I trust uh, I, yeah, or I believe that if people uh, if people are trying enough, they are able to produce usable and accessible websites, which are nice. So it's only a question about effort, how, how much time you spend on it, and how, um, how deep is your knowledge in the field of accessibility, usability, UX, and so on. Because uh, this, uh, this topic which you touch is quite uh, related to, for example, that situation when some graphic designer, which, uh, which got uh, plenty of work on paper and uh, produce really nice designs, visual designs, so is asked for producing some websites, then it's totally disaster. So, uh, like in almost 100 percent, because those guys know pretty much, mm, pretty much. Uh, a lot about the visual design itself, but they don't know anything about the UI interactions and so on. So this, please avoid this situation. Ask friends from, for example, DTP Studio to produce something interactive. But on the other hand, if, uh, if you know, somebody spent enough time on project, then it's definitely possible to produce nice pages, which are also easy to use. It's, it's only time effort. 
or is, is was this uh, answer to Thank your question? Thank you. I totally like disagree with you about bringing right brain people into projects. I think every <laughs> like user, every open source project that's oriented towards consumers should have a designer or a, a usability expert as part of that team. I think yeah. it's a learned set of skills. Of course, your first attempt at doing a website, if you're a print designer, is going to suck. I mean, how many, hello world. I, you know, where do you go? It, there's a learning curve. But designers absolutely can and will learn the rules of the game if they're given a sub supportive environment. Uh, what I think is more important, though, is the end result. Visual beauty is important because it's a signal. It tells you that time and thought has gone into this application. It tells you this is a friendly place. This is a walled garden. This is somewhere you can spend time. Usability is important because it actually lets you get your job done. So in the hierarchy, I feel like usability is what has to come first, but I don't feel like that needs to be the domain of programmers only, and I think that's actually really dangerous because programmers think in a way that is very different than users. They sorry, sorry uh, guys, I don't want to interrupt, but maybe you can take this I'm actually one to one a discussion talk. to after the talk, because we have a, a bunch, sorry, sorry yes. to interrupt you, but we have a bunch of other questions from the internet, Man. from people who cannot be present here and who cannot ask the speaker and discuss with them after the talk. So sorry to cut you off, really sorry, but can you discuss this afterwards? I would yes. like to go on with Come the questions. Come to my talk at 2.10 p.m. I'm doing a lightning talk then. All righty, okay. just okay. catch him later. All right, sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, please go on with the next question from the internet, please. So a user from the internet asks, what do you think about infinite scrolling, for example, with websites? OK. Uh, infinite scrolling, it's a nice thing. Uh, or nice question, sorry, nice question. And, uh, and actually, maybe it's also a nice thing, but again, it has to be handled carefully because uh, if uh, you uh, if you don't care enough uh, about your layout and uh, you produce on the page something what we call false uh, folder or false footer, simple the visual break in the flow, then the user probably. Uh, should stop scrolling. So the infinite scrolling is good in the cases when uh, the content on the page built something uh, what, we can, what we can call like continuous stream. Like imagine the Twitter. That's the, the probably the best example. Like. There is always obvious that there is something more of content under the fold. And my experience said that uh, once people start scrolling, they are able to continue with scrolling almost uh, almost <laughs> without the end or <laughs> like <coughs> uh, until you say stop simply. It's your fault when you cut them off from the stream. It's design fault. So infinite scrolling is possible, but has to be handled carefully. That's my, that's my point of view. All right, next question from Mike number one, please. Hello, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I watch myself often um, choose commercial software products over open source software when I uh, really see a huge uh, difference in usability. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, to, to ask from a uh, positive perspective, um, GitHub is a great tool for programmers to collaboratively, uh, collaboratively work on code. Um, and my question is, do you know of any tool that is like a GitHub for UI designers so you can, um, yeah, work mm. better on, on the UI and maybe attract more UI designers to your open source software? Uh, what? A resource, a resource space. It's, uh, but actually, 
I don't have any experience with this. That's what I have to say, because uh, my work is much more closely connect to, for example, mapping the flows and organizing them. And pretty much a lot of this work is surprisingly on paper and post-its. Mm. Yeah. And it's, it's uh, not, I, I, I know that at, at this moment I didn't help you too, uh, too much, but <clears throat> the, the design collaboration works, as, as, as far as I know, different way than programmers' collaboration. So then we use different set of tools how, okay. to, how to collaborate, uh, workshops I and so on. So I imagine something like mm. where you could uh, compare c two flows and then discuss mm. over it or something. Nothing. Uh, we use meetings for this. Okay. <laughs> and uh, actually, not only in person meetings, but we discuss this over, over via, via Skype, sharing uh, screens and so on. Yeah? Like you, we, we always uh, take pictures of our notes or drawings and show it to each other. And this is how we collaborate. Okay. Not not by some uh, platform, but by meetings. Okay, thank talking, you. Talking, talk and talk and talk. <laughs> All right, next question from Mike number four, please. So uh, I have a question with regard to evolution of uh, GUI design. Uh, is there anything which so to say, is completed at one point of time, so there is no improvement anymore. For example, if you have a temperature uh, regulator, uh, there are m multitude of things, but uh, I think that the turn kind of uh, switch is, is the most uh, important or best one here. And the second thing is, I'm missing a point about the environment uh, where it is used. Mm. I'm sorry, at this moment, I'm not sure if I understand your question. Like what? So, again, uh, with regard to revolution, so is there a GUI design which at one point of time is finished? So with the given um, yeah, technologies, there is no further improvement. Would you think in that way or uh, not? And I, I believe that there is always some space for improvement. It only depends if you like to face it. I, like, I imagine, I, I heard about a nice example of like, the work which looks like finished, or the design which looks like finished, and it's simple the fork, like, or, uh, oh, it wasn't fork, it was a spoon, sorry, spoon, it was spoon. Like, imagine that you get spoon in your hand, and uh, it's up to you if you like to improve it or not and maybe you will find that there is some other better solution than this. So uh, the, the improvements are always possible. That's, that's definitely the ultimate truth. <laughs> or, All right, next right. question from Mike number three, please. Uh, thank you very much for your top, uh, talk, Bob. Uh, you mentioned accessibility uh, mm -hmm. a, a couple of times, and uh, that's a topic that's uh, close to me because I've worked with uh, university mm. students in the past who uh, have had disabilities, who've been partially or totally deaf, blind, mm. have motor impairment, and uh, whether software is usable and accessible for them some isn't oh, is often not the difference between being more or less frustrated. It's the difference between actually being able to do something at all or mm -hmm. not. Uh, with regards to the principles that you mentioned as your, your top 10 here, uh, with a usability pers or with an accessibility perspective for people who have disabilities, um, temporary or permanent, uh, is there anything that you uh, would add uh, to say that this is what you need to do to make sure that you cover accessibility, or is it just the same sort of thing but looked at it in a different direction? Um, nice question. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm. I used to work in the field of accessibility also like last 10 years and I quite hate the approach that the accessibility is something different. And if I can suggest something to everybody here, 
don't separate accessibility from the usability or neither, for example, CEO. They are quite overlapping and the, the best possible approach is to start with the accessibility since the beginning, study at least some basic points and simple incorporate accessibility principles in each project since beginning and simply don't think about it as something special or extra. That's the best possible approach. Yeah. So at this moment, I don't like to add any other important points because there is something uh, like at least another 10 of them. But I'd like to encourage you to study at least the basics of accessibility and simply use them because it really can help to many people and not only to somehow uh, somehow um, no, disabled people, but the impact of accessibility is really huge also on ordinary people, on us, because everything what's accessible is automatically, or like in intention, uh, also better for uh, from perspective of the usability. Yeah, so that's that's the main point which you please try to keep in your mind. All right, next question from mic number seven up there. Hi, uh, I just wanted to add something about the idea of different um, styles of UIs for different mm. levels of users. You know, like uh, saying an expert UI and a standard UI. I think the problem there might be that most um, normal users can't judge their own level of understanding of the, of the app and might think they're an expert and go into the expert UI and then get totally overwhelmed, which is another problem with things like this. Think that's a, a real problem or just uh, might never occur in, in, the, in the real world? Mm. <laughs> I, <laughs> I can try to answer from only my point of view, not, not some, something like ultimate true. Uh, my personal preferences, if I understand correctly to your answer, uh, to your question, is uh, that I prefer only one and as much as possible simple interface for everybody and don't make any uh, like extra versions or branches for expert users, disabled users, German users, or whatever. Like, as, as I mentioned earlier, the accessibility is integrated part of uh, UI design. Then this topic of, of the, like, how to call it, le level expertise, maybe, <laughs> is Another another point which I really don't like to see in UIs. Is it, was this yeah, answer? I, I, I agree. I just wanted yeah. to add this. Yeah. Point. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Thank you. We have another question from the internet, and as we're running out of time, this might be the last. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice about user interfaces for systems with dedicated controllers, like video game consoles? Mm. I'm sorry, no, <laughs> because <clears throat> this is uh, too far from my field. So I'm really sorry that the last question wasn't answered. <laughs> well, as this was a very yeah. quick answer, we can take the last question from mic number two. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> two points. Uh, one is about sound. I think uh, there are almost no good reasons to play sound as a, as a feedback, but uh, lots of reasons against it. Uh, and I uh, see the Mercedes example is not a car example because uh, normally you won't open and close your door uh, several times a minute. And if you close your Mercedes door, you're not sitting in your office with your mm -hmm. colleagues next desk. You're not sitting in the train. You're not sitting in a restaurant. So just okay. no sounds. 
Uh, just imagine uh, people would have sounds as feedback on their gadgets in here in the uh. sound. Would be terrible. Uh, the second yeah. is uh, about icons and text. Uh, I would underline that uh, there should be text anywhere, uh, in any case, uh, not just an icon. And uh, traffic signs are not a counterexample for me because they didn't change much uh, in last over mm. decades. Mm. Uh, Okay, pedestrians depicted don't have hats nowadays, but a stop sign looks like a stop sign 50 years ago. And uh, people are trained to these uh, mm. and to these signs. So uh, if you, once you know them, you know them. And uh, icons in software are just different. They change every year, every version, uh, just to change to say, "Hi, I'm the new version." And so you just can't rely. Uh, people understand them. And at least I, I appreciate every application that gives me the opportunity to switch to a, a text-only version uh, of, of menus and uh, buttons because I can much better uh, go, to, go through menus uh, with text items than, uh, and read them than, than Trying to read those tiny icons, uh, maybe with slightly mod modifications to difference uh, uh, to make a difference bet between them. No, let, let, let away with that. Okay, uh, really thank you uh, for this note because it's nice wrap up to this session. Uh, the true is there is nothing like ultimate and the universe of true. Uh, it always depends with sounds, with icons. It it is always a case of context. And please keep in your minds that in all cases, in all of designs, the actual context of the of usage of the design is the most important thing. So, for example, yes, I completely agree with you that the, it could be really annoying if every tiny uh, notification got on sound. And actually, this is really related to this point number 10, notification overload, for example. But it depends if, for example, Airplanes doesn't have uh, audio warning about uh, the to to near or to close approach to another airplane. It's also UI. It's interface of the airplane, and if it doesn't really loudly scream like danger, danger, there is another airplane, then uh, there will be much more death. <laughs> Yeah, so it depends. It depends. It depends. Always keep in mind the context. And the same is the same I can say or add to the topic of icons. Sometimes you can use them, cannot use them, with, with text, without text. It's really, really, really important to observe the current situation, current environment current state of mind of the user, and so on, and based on them, make your decisions. This could be maybe my next talk here, <laughs> yeah, because it's completely different, like different topic or different uh, point of view to the UI. OK? Well, thank you very much for wrapping up this talk. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for coming and for your questions. Let's thank Bob for taking us on the treasure hunt. Thank you so much for your talk. Thank you.